The FBI and Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS one week from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a swamp that'll drag you breath by breath into its shadowed pools, or it's a meadow shining with golden light. It's a place and a time and a loneliness that reaches out for you, then beckons you into an airless room and locks the door. You get out or you don't. Either way, it's Broadway, My Beat. A man dies in silence and in dark, and the city sets up a shrieking clamor, and you're part of it. You ride a scream through the crowded, heat-heavy streets, and then you hit a dead end. And it's a building, and a room at the top of the building, and it's a man lying in the center of the room while other men take notes on the history of his dying. All right, Joe, get one from this angle, huh? Yeah, hold on while Danny. I focus, will you? Hiya, Danny. Okay, that's good. Got it. Now get a shot of all that food. Oh, what a banquet this guy hey, Danny, out from Danny, come over here. This will interest you. It never interests me, Doc. What have you got? Val Dane, the novelist. Ever read any of his stuff? No. Neither do I. The wife does, though. Says she's mad about him. But she went mad over Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Well, let's have tea some other time, huh, Doc? Tell me about Dane. Hey. Yeah, well... Hey, first tell him about me, huh, Doc? Tell him about me. Oh, uh, yeah. Danny, this is Clem, Clem Pic Picasso. Yeah, that's who I am. Picasso. Picasso? Haven't I heard your name someplace? Sure you have. Clem Picasso, the painter. I paint flagpoles. Yeah, that's where it was. You were painting a portrait of a flagpole for Dana, is that it? No, you don't understand. I'm the real article. Let me tell you about me. Yeah. If it wasn't for me, you guys wouldn't even know Dane was dead. Tell me more about yourself. Well, I was painting a flagpole on top of this building, see? All of a sudden came a gust of wind. I grabbed hold of the pole, dropped my pail of paint right through that skylight there, see? I look for spilled paint, I find a dead man. That is the experience that happened today to Clem Picasso, flagpole painter. Unforgettable. Uh, it'll live in my memory, too. Uh, you got anything to add to that, Doc? <laughs> Only this, Danny. This room is a fortress. Dane must have built it on top of his penthouse for a retreat. It's ventilated by an air conditioning system. The only source of outside light is that skylight, and that's at least 30 feet from the floor. Mm -hmm. There's no phone, and the room was locked and bolted from the outside. Dane couldn't get out. This place is bare. No writing materials, nothing. Yeah, like a tomb. Maybe he needed this kind of atmosphere to think. Maybe. All the boys found when they broke in here was Dane and that table, loaded with food, all jarred. Fruits, chicken, all sorts of good things to eat. What's the matter, Doc? You hungry? Just tell me how Dane died. He died of starvation, Danny. Huh? Yeah, yeah all that food, and he died of starvation. Curious man, this Val Dane. Now, huh, Danny? I could have dropped it right there. Val Dane, I told myself, had committed suicide by starving himself to death, thereby obtaining new material for his next novel. That's what I told myself. That's how much sense it made. And that's why I couldn't drop it. In New York, hardly anybody dies in a vacuum. A man as famous as Val Dane never does. There has to be a close friend or relative to break the news to, and in a case like this, to question. It wasn't tough to find out that Val Dane had a wife, now divorced, and a city directory said she lived on West 79th Street. It was apartment 105. As simple as that. Yes, what is it? You're Mrs. Dane? Well, only approximately. Mr. Dane and I are divorced. I've kept his name for my son's sake. Uh, you're... Uh, Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Oh, how interesting. We've never had a caller here from the police. Won't you come in? Thank you. I do hope you'll stay until Jimmy comes home. Jimmy is my son, Mr. Clover. I'm sure he'd love to hear the experiences you'd have to tell him. Uh, in here, the living room. That's quite a collection of glass toys there on the floor. Clowns, building sets, animals, and all in glass. Jimmy must be an unusual boy. Oh, yes, he is. That's all I have left in life, Mr. Clover, to make him happy. Uh, there's something I have to tell you that might make you quite sad. About Jimmy? No, it's about your former husband, Val Dane. He's dead. 
Oh, I'm so happy. Well, I mean I'm relieved. I was afraid with Jimmy being on the streets... Then it might... doesn't affect you, Mr. Dane's death? I think I should be more sad if I read in the papers that a man I never met had died at the age of 93. I see. No, you don't, really. How could I feel sorrow for Val Dane? He was a miserable ten years thrust into my life. Why do you say that? Because he was a talented egoist. He cared nothing for Jimmy. He cared even less for me. We lived for him. He lived for Val Dane. Uh, when did you see him last? Two years ago. In that horrible cabin in the Adirondacks. He, he forced us to go there so he could write. And one more thing, Mr. Clover. Yes? When you write your report about me, put this down. Put down Joanne Dane, Val Dane's ex-wife. She's glad he's dead. <laughs> I didn't bother to tell Joanne Dane that her former husband had starved to death. I had a feeling she would have enjoyed that too much, and death doesn't need laughing at. But when I hit Broadway again, death was screaming at me in big black letters. Val Dane had become public property for a nickel a copy. You got the funny papers, too. I called headquarters and asked Sergeant Tartaglia if anything new had turned up. Something new had. Get back to your office right away, the sergeant said. There's a guy who wants to see you. He's hysterical. The sergeant wasn't kidding. <laughs> Something in my office makes you laugh like that? The pollen, maybe? I can't help it. It's rich. It's the richest one I've ever heard. Okay, okay, come out of it. Who are you? Uh, my name's my name's Brooks, Lyle Brooks. <laughs> Lyle Brooks, huh? Tell me gently, what's so rich? Oh, if I think of it again, Lieutenant, I shall roll in your floor in continued convulsions of hilarity. And think of something real sad, like a right to the jaw, and tell me what's in your mind. Why, why, Valdane starved to death. Don't you think that's funny? No? Well, I think it's funny. What tickles you about a man's death, Brooks? About Val's death? He was such a pig, and he starved to death. Well, that lieutenant is humor. Category, ironic humor. What's your interest in Val Dane's death? I'm his ghost. Ghost, huh? Pataglia! Yeah, Danny? Now, what do you want? Book this guy for impersonating a human. Hey, that's a serious... Right huh? now, Tataglia, book him. Well, sure, for impersonating the human, huh? Come on, you. Policemen have a sense of jest, too, I see. Come on, you. So I'll explain. I am Val Dane's ghost. You're doing it again, Brooks. His ghost writer. I did much of the writing which is credited to our so literary Mr. Dane. That's why I came to give myself up. To give yourself up, huh? Did you have anything to do with this dying? Assuredly not. But you might think so. I hated him. Val Dane cheated me time and again. But this time was the biggest cheat of all. Hey, what's he talking about, Danny? I'm talking about the great fake, Val Dane's latest book. I wrote at least half of it, you know. Got no credit. Val said I would get credit. What are you trying to tell us? Just this. If Val Dane met with foul play in any way, I should head your list of suspects. Me and Cynthia, of course. We mustn't forget Cynthia. Oh, we can't forget her. Cynthia who? Cynthia Troy. Why, everybody knows she's the woman in the great fake. Heavens, do you mean to say you haven't read the book, Mr. Clover? Mr. Clover hadn't, but Mr. Clover did. The Great Fake, new novel by Val Dane, available at your favorite bookstore, $3 the copy. I bought it, noted it carefully on my expense account, and went home and curled up with $3 worth of vitriol. Because that's what the novel was, a book of hate, a sneering book, a book without humor. There wasn't a person in it, only caricatures dipped in acid. And the leading woman of the novel had been dipped deepest of all. It tweaked me. The next morning, I just had to see her. <laughs> I'd been expecting a call from the police, Mr. Clover. Drink? Uh, no, thanks, Miss Troy. Then you won't mind if I do. Uh, no. I realize it's before noon, but then I haven't had my breakfast yet. You sure you won't have a drink? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh... Just why had you been expecting a call from the police, Miss Troy? <laughs> because I have no doubt about your intelligence. One thing you must know in my business is never to underestimate anybody. You mind if I ask what your business is? The same as in Val's novel. I give parties, Mr. Clover. I arrange that the unfortunate rich be impressed by their leisure and their wealth. By opulent and clever parties, Mr. Clover. For an opulent price, Mr. Clover. Now the question, Miss Troy. Why was Why I... were you expected, Mr. Clover? Hmm. The answer is a question. How do you get a man to starve to death? 
I've been asking myself that. Do you think somebody got Val Dane to starve? Undoubtedly. Val Dane was a man whose only love was Val Dane. He was too jealous of his love to kill himself. He would never commit suicide. Then you think he was murdered? I uh, believe I implied that, don't you? Did you kill him? <laughs> the idea titillates me. Yes, it's a rare thought. <laughs> Ask me that again, Mr. Clover. Look, Miss Troy, the social graces aren't one of my, uh, social graces. In your circle, how do you tell a lady to quit stalling? By telling her. Then let's quit stalling, huh? Very well. You've uh, read Val's novel, yes? It made a fool of me, didn't it? Is that why you killed him? Locked him in that room and starved him to death? I should like to have done that, Mr. Clover. The idea... Yeah, I know. It titillates you. Uh, you've started a train of thought, Mr. Clover. I should like to have locked him in that room and spent days of ecstatic joy watching Val Dane starve. I went back to the clean, almost domestic air of the police laboratory and waited while the lab boys checked and rechecked the coroner's report. No matter how you shook it, it came out that Val Dane had died of starvation. Then it caught up with me what Cynthia Troy had said. It would have given her days of ecstatic joy to watch Dane starve. There was only one place anyone could have done that. That was from the roof and through the skylight of Dane's death room. I took a uniformed officer with me because maybe that kind of ecstasy leaves a clue. Danny, I've been over every inch of this roof. There ain't a particle of it that ain't intimate and familiar to me. I'm also sick of the sight of it under my nose. Uh, okay, officer, you can get up off your hands and knees now. Uh, thanks, Danny. You know, Danny, maybe it'd help if you told me what it is we're looking for. I don't know. Thread of cloth, a cigarette butt, the smell of hate. The smell... Huh? Hey, Danny, you dizzy from the altitude or something? <laughs> no, no. You can go now, officer. I won't need you anymore. Okay. Hey, you know, it's kind of pretty up here. Huh? All the lights of the city. Gee, that reminds me. I think I'll take my wife to the top of the Empire State Building. It'll be like a second honeymoon. Well, so long, Danny. Don't stay too long in the night air. Yeah. There has to be something. Something. Hmm. Didn't make sense what I saw. A piece of scotch tape stuck to one of the panes of the skylight. I leaned down to examine it. And then there was something that did make sense. The sound of someone moving toward me. And then I... I whipped out my gun and ducked behind the jet of the skylight. And then it found me. woke a sickly dawn spread itself over the roof and over me. I took inventory and found I was missing two items. A valuable hunk of skin from my right temple and a piece of scotch tape. Just that. Scotch tape. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. A thrill a minute. High tension suspense from the word go. Dramatic excitement that builds and builds until it explodes in a smashing climax. That's Inner Sanctum, the great mystery show that's another of CBS' top-notch Monday night programs. You'll find Inner Sanctum one of the most entertaining spots on your Monday night listening schedule. And remember, Lux Radio Theater returns next Monday, August 29th, for its 15th year of great dramatic presentations. Inner Sanctum... Lux Radio Theater, every Monday night over most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. Morning on Broadway is like any other August morning on a thousand other main drags. People are caught up in a salary to be earned, baseball scores and the heat. You keep moving and do the best you can. The best I could do was to try to push my way through a brick wall. Progress was practically at a standstill. But by now, one thing was obvious. I had a murder on my hands. 
Valdane had been found starved to death in a locked room with a banquet spread before him. That in itself was something to nick the curiosity. But when I got too curious, somebody had taken a shot at me. Draw a line and add that up and you get a six-letter word meaning foul play. At headquarters, after I had my head bandaged, Sergeant Tartaglia was terse and intelligent about the whole thing. I can't figure it, Danny. Now, don't try it, Tartaglia. If you could figure it, you'd become invaluable to the department. You'd never get your pension. Did you get what I told you to? Yeah, one piece of frosted glass, just like you said. Thanks. Where'd you get it? Now, Danny, where would you get a piece of frosted glass at police headquarters? Out of the men's powder room. Uh, you better hurry up with it. Yeah. Well, we'll tear off a piece of scotch tape. Well, we'll paste it over the glass like this. Uh, what are you doing, Danny? Pasting scotch tape on frosted glass. It's the latest craze. Now we hold it up to the light. Look through it, Tartaglia. Get up close and look through it. Hey, hey you can see right through it. The part of the glass with the scotch tape on it, you can see right through. Hey, that's a neat trick, Danny. It's also a clue, Sergeant. The skylight to Val Dane's retreat was frosted glass. Somebody stuck that missing piece of tape on the glass so they could watch Val Dane die. Uh-huh. Uh, Taglia, suppose you were locked in a room loaded with food and you were starving to death. What would you do? I'd eat the food. Unless what, Tartaglia? Unless nothing, Danny. I'd eat the food. Unless what, Tartaglia? Danny, I said I'd eat the food unless it was po... Unless it was poison, Danny. You're so right. Tartaglia, I want all the food found in Valdane's room transferred to the technical lab right away. I want every piece of it analyzed for poison. I want the analysis on my desk as soon as possible. Right. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. Meshikov, sir, assigned to follow Cynthia Troy. Oh, okay, Meshikov, what do you got? At 9 a.m. this morning, Cynthia Troy entered the Fifth Avenue apartment of one Michael Green. Who? Uh, I mean, Cream. Michael Cream. C R E A M. Cream. You know, like in Cream. So I took a plant in the hall. At 9.15, I heard loud voices, which at 9.20 become a heated argument. Who is this Merkel Cream? Oh, him I checked. He's a yogi. A yogi, huh? Oh, that's interesting. These guys go on starvation diets to get next to their souls. Uh, thanks, Machikov. Stick with Cynthia. Hey, Tataglia. Yeah, Danny. Get my bed of nails. I'm calling on a yogi. The yogi with a homogenized name, Merkel Cream, lived in a rich, creamy Fifth Avenue mansion with a high money fat content. The outside stairs were covered with a thick layer of perfumed oriental carpet. When you rang, a girl made of copper with bells on the ankles of her bare feet and a jewel stuck in the middle of her forehead opened the door. With a scented arm, motioned you into the presence. The presence was a muscular man with the body of a professional football player, wearing a plumed turban and an imported English tweed loincloth. He sat in the middle of the floor, bathed in the celestial glow of a baby pink spotlight. And then, the presence spake. You have come... Yeah, Mr. Cream, I... Speak not when I speak. You have come... You said that. You have come to attune yourself to the eternal harmony that lies six fathoms deep in the cosmic sea. You will go into the cleansing room. Huh? You will go into the cleansing room and there cleanse yourself and attire yourself in a loincloth. You will find a suitable array hanging from pegs. The uh, panther skin for you, I think. Look, Mr. Have Cream... Have no I... fear. They are sterilized after each use. Now go, tortured one, go. Look, Cream, I'm not here to cross your palm with How silver. How dare you speak to Merkel Cream thus? How dare you, savage? That's me. Look into your crystal ball and tell me why you should scream at a tortured one named Cynthia Troy and vice versa. How did you know? Don't answer. I will answer for you. You are omniscient, clairvoyant... Like the me that is the true me. Like the me that is Danny Clover, New York police. I got a hunk of protoplasm named Meshikov who floats under windows and soaks up things like a fishwife's brawl between you and Cynthia. But you are clairvoyant. The Cynthia underneath Cynthia is a fishwife. She pays you to tell her that? Cynthia Troy is a disciple. Disciple fall out sometimes, as you know. I've heard. And Val Dane, he, he was a disciple too. What did you do to Dane, Yogi? Put him on a starvation diet for his eternal harmony? Then you've read his book. Yeah, he gave you a paragraph. Let's see if I can remember the exact words. The yogi, a vicious parasite, a jeweled vampire, a stinking phony. Did I quote the exact words exactly, yogi cream? Dane died in a way that pleases me. 
He died in an agony of hunger. What does it matter if his exact words are remembered? To him or to me, what does it matter? Yeah. Get up, Cream. You're coming with me. I got a feeling you can give me better answers with your pants on. Do you believe that I'm a fake? You believe what Dane said of me? To put it bluntly, Cream, yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Maybe Dane killed your lush racket with his bestseller. Maybe you knew it would. Maybe you arranged for him to die. Let's go. Help me up, Mr. Clover. Yeah, cosmic harmony makes you weak. All right. You know I can't afford to go to jail. It would ruin me. Let go of me. If you move, Mr. Clover, I'll break your back as if it were a stick of wood. Let go of me. A little trick I learned from a man on Amsterdam Avenue. Ten judo lessons for 20 bucks. Worth it, don't you think? Don't you think? I got my lessons for free. Well, send them back. They're no good. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. Now, my way, Cream. Let's do it my way. Oh. Well, what do you know? The yogi found cosmic harmony. Has to be a phone in this dump. Yeah. Headquarters, Tartaglia speaking. Tartaglia, this is Danny. Send a stretcher to pick up Yogi. Mr. Merkel Cream? Yeah, he spilled out of his bottle. One stretcher coming up. Hey, Danny, we got a report on that food. Yeah? Give it to me. Well, I was about to, Danny. You know, it is very interesting. Tartaglia, if you don't talk fast, order a stretcher for yourself, too. What about that food? Well, that's what I'm telling you. So interesting. It was not poison, Danny. Baldane's food was not poison. <laughs> Until the yogi was in condition to talk to me, I had to talk to myself. What kind of man was Val Dane? That was the big question, the important question. Locked in a room long enough to starve to death and he refused to touch the food, the unpoisoned food at his fingertips. Why? What was the mentality of the man? Once, long ago, he had been human enough to marry, to have a family. Maybe that was the clue. Once somebody loved him. Maybe his ex-wife, Joanne Dane, would be calmer now. Maybe she could divorce her memory from ugliness. Yes? Who are you? I'm Danny Clover, police detective. Who are you? I'm the landlady. What can I do for you? I want to see Joanne Dane. Joanne's not in any trouble. She's a fine girl. What kind of trouble would she be in? No, no, I didn't say she was in any trouble. I just wanted to talk to her. Well, she ain't in. Where is she? Oh, Joanne's out for a walk. With Jimmy? Jimmy? What are you talking about? Her son, Jimmy. Mister, you got the wrong address. Joanne's got no son. Nobody lives here by the name of Jimmy. Say, what kind of a detective are you anyway? Yeah. What kind, Clover? Let's go find out. <laughs> Here are the vital statistics he asked for, Danny. Yeah? Hey, when are you going to take me to see South Pacific, Danny? Oh, any day now, doll. I'm just waiting for that inheritance. Oh, Danny, stop pulling my leg. Here. Know the vital statistics, Danny. <laughs> Read it to me, doll, because your voice is like honey. Read it to me. <laughs> Get him. James Dane, age four, son of Val and Joanne Dane. Died June 22nd, 1947. Cause of death, accidental poisoning. Death spasms took four hours. Remoteness of cabin and Adirondacks made it impossible to reach boy in time to help. Signed, Dr. James Robeson. Hey, hey, Danny, where are you going? I haven't finished. Danny, come back here. I've got some things to settle. I was out when you called before, Mr. Clover. Yeah, I know. Joanne, your landlady said you'd gone for a walk. With Jimmy. Jimmy loves to walk on a sunny day like this. Where's Jimmy now? Out playing. Joanne, I asked you before. Now, don't lie. When was the last time you saw Valdane? I won't lie. A few weeks ago, as I told you. A few weeks ago, yeah. Another question. Why did you go to see him? To ask him for money. I hated myself for it, but Jimmy needs clothes. You see, he'll be going to school this fall, and... I see. Joanne, did you... 
take anything with you, anything that you gave to Val? Well, I, I don't think so. I can't remember that I did. Food? Why... Uh, food in jars, chicken, preserves, things like that? Well, now that you mention it, Mr. Clover, I... Yes, I think I... Yes, Joanne, you told Val that food was poison, didn't you? Just before you left, just before you closed the door behind you. You told Val it was poison, didn't you, Joanne? What are you talking about? Just before you locked the door and bolted it behind you, you told him that. You pointed a gun at him and told him that. Why should I do that? Joanne, Joanne, listen to me. Jimmy is dead, isn't he? Jimmy dead? Oh, <laughs> Jimmy dead? Jimmy died two years ago. You know that, Joanne. No, what? I don't know what you're saying. In the Adirondacks, one summer two years ago. Jimmy took some poison by mistake. There was no way to get help soon enough. You and Val had to watch him die. You're making all that up. You blamed it on your husband. You blamed him for bringing you there because it was so remote. No, no, no. It wasn't that way at all. Yes, it was. You left that food with your husband, Joanne. You told him it was poisoned. You knew he'd never have courage to taste that food after seeing the way Jimmy died. Your husband took his chances with starvation rather than suffer the way Jimmy did. Jimmy suffer? Jimmy dead? Yes, Joanne, he's dead. These glass toys are only a lie that you're making yourself Put believe. Put them down. They're Jimmy's toys. Your final revenge, Joanne, you had to watch Val die. Yes. You came back each night to look through the skylight. Yes. And finally, when he was dead, you came back to remove that tape. That's when you saw me. Yes. And I wanted to kill you because I was frightened of you, Mr. Clover. That's the only reason. I didn't hate you then. You've got to believe me. I didn't hate you. Joanne. But I hate you now. And I've got to kill you now, Mr. Clover. I've got Joanne, to... Joanne, put down that gun. I'll kill you. <laughs> you. You broke Jimmy's toys. You broke them. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, all your beautiful toys broken, broken. All your toys. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. How can you forgive me, son? I'm sorry. Hello. Give me the police department. This is Danny Clover. No, I don't want a riot squad. I want an ambulance. And a doctor. It took 15 minutes for them to come. And in that time, I watched the shadow soak up the remnants of her mind. How do you tell a woman her life is done? How do you fill it in reports... How do you make statistics out of it and file it in a ledger? How do you write sorrow as a number? How? Broadway's really living now. It's got a creamy yogi back in circulation. Cynthia is throwing a marvelous party for Patrolman Mishikev. And the ghost, Lyle Brooks, he's haunting another author. Broadway's jaunty now and it wears a chip on its shoulder. It's flexing its muscles and daring the nighttime. And before it's over, it'll tear itself apart and laugh at its own agony. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, was directed tonight by Cliff Howell, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. That man is coming back again. Yes, Arthur Godfrey is returning from his vacation and he'll be helping some promising young performers up the ladder of success when Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts return to the air next Monday night over most of these same CBS network stations. Along with the Talent Scouts, you can hear such great shows as My Friend Irma, Inner Sanctum, The Lux Radio Theater, and The Bob Hawk Show, all on Monday nights and all on CBS. Stay tuned now for Mr. Keene, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you hear Lux Radio Theater every Monday, the Columbia Broadcasting System.